Amen. Amen. All right. This morning's sermon is going to be a little bit different than the majority of sermons, uh, specifically in Sunday mornings. And that is because normally I don't do uh, uh, what would be considered you know, textual preaching on Sunday morning and Sunday evening. So in this particular uh, sermon this morning, I'm going to be going through 2 Kings chapter number 7. Well, I'm going to preach through the entire chapter. And the, the purpose of that is because I'm going to be culminating the kind of unofficial series that we've been going through. Uh, where we are dealing with, you know, and a good title for that series would be, Lord, why is this happening to me? Well, I've been going through all of the different reasons why we experience trials and tribulations and troubles in our Christian life. You know, sometimes it's the persecution from the devil. Sometimes it's because we're in sin and God is punishing us for our sin. Sometimes, as we went over you know, uh, last Sunday evening, God just wants us to lose so that someone else can win or someone else can be blessed out of our loss. This morning, I want to kind of culminate all of those subjects in one sermon, and I want this to be a conclusion uh, for that topic. And the title of the sermon this morning is, There is Light at the End of the Tunnel. There is Light at the End of the Tunnel. Now, here in 2 Kings chapter number 7, uh, there is a very critical situation that is going on. It's a very, very hard time. We talk about trials, tribulations, and troubles. They are dealing with a very, very hard time. I want you to go back to 2 Kings chapter number 6 so we can get the context of what is going on in Jerusalem at this time. Look at verse number 24. It says this. And this is actually Israel. I'm sorry, I said Jerusalem. This is Israel. It's the capital of Israel, Samaria, is what we're going to be dealing with. Look at verse number 24. And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts, that's all of his army, and went up and besieged Samaria. So he has compassed it round about. He has his soldiers all the way around the walls of the city. Verse 25. <clears throat> And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it, until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver, and the fourth part of a cab of doves dung for five pieces of silver. So right here we can kind of give an idea of how bad the famine is. Of course, maybe in the very beginning, you know, you would have, you know, a large roast uh, you know, whether that be uh, of pork or of beef that was sold for, you know, four score pieces of silver. But that became so scarce because the dearth of the famine was so strong that as the, as the, uh, uh, the, 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 all the pork and all the good meat and all of, you know, uh, uh, the other portions of food that people would normally partake in, as they began to disappear, now all you have left is what? You have, you know, there it mentions an ass's head. But not only that, it goes so far as to refer to uh, 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 the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung. Now, of course, I'm sure that's no one here has ever partook in that, and I'm sure no one here ever wants to experience that. But it, what it does is, and the reason why that's recorded, is to kind of give you insight into how bad the dearth was, how bad the times were, how really bad you know, the tribulation was that they were having to experience. People were literally having to pay so that they could consume dung, so that they could consume the dung of a dove. And the only reason why was because so that they could just stay alive. People were dying left and right, kind of like we're going through the book of Lamentations. People are, there's death everywhere from the famine. But there are some people that are, that are able to survive that still have some money. But even with their money, the only thing that they can purchase and eat is the head of an ass. It's like a mule. Or also, you know, the excrement of a, of a dove, of a bird. That is hard times. That's obviously more hard times, uh, worse times than any of us have ever experienced. But the point is that it's bad tribulation and trials. And it gets worse. Look at verse number 26. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help my lord, O king. And he said, If the lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? So he's saying, if, if, if God hasn't reached down and helped you, know, what am I going to do? Obviously, he himself is, is, is in a hard time, too. He's saying, what can I do for you? Only the Lord can help you now. That's his, his point. Look at verse uh, 28. And the king said unto her, what aileth thee? So he does ask her, what's wrong with you? And she answered, this woman said unto me, give thy son that we may eat him today. And we will eat my son tomorrow. Verse 29. So we boiled my son and did eat him. 
And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son, that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. Verse 30, And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman, that he rent his clothes. And he passed by upon the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. And the sackcloth, of course, is to mourn. But he, he, you know, he's walking upon the wall, and this woman comes to him. And she actually, and I don't know what she's thinking, but she, she speaks to the king to try to, to try to get the king to help her in her situation. And what her situation is, is that a woman came and coerced her into boiling her own son and eating him. But the way in which she did that was she said, hey, we'll eat your son today, and tomorrow we'll eat my son. And the king, when he hears this, he just, just rips his clothes. And the reason is because now he has, it, you know, it, it's resonated even further with him on how bad the times really are. Of course, I'm sure this woman, it's a depraved act of what she did. But it's also because of the famine, without having nutrition, without having food, the sicknesses, disease. This is probably a woman that came to him that looked similar unto a drug, drug addict or a crackhead. And he's probably thinking, why are you telling me this? Have you lost your mind? And that exactly is, I'm sure, what had taken place. You know what it does? It shows you what a toll this was taking on people. That she was so deluded that she thought the king was going to help her. And he just rips his clothes because now he can see what hard times it is. How bad everything is. You know, he put on sackcloth and that's a sign of mourning. It's like burlap and he's just walking around the walls of the city to show to the people how bad this is. So we can see they're going through extremely, extremely hard times. And notice that the king makes a statement, if the Lord hasn't helped you, what am I going to do for you? And it's almost like hopelessness. It's almost as if he sees no light at the end of the tunnel. That he doesn't think that the Lord is going to come and to help him. But I want you to look at chapter number 7, verse number 1, as we begin this chapter, going through this. And the man of God comes, and it says this, Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Now, if you... Look up the measurements of a shekel and things like that. That's a very low amount. And just to, to try to demonstrate this, and this is not a perfect equivalency, it would be like buying a loaf of bread for a penny, if you will. It would be like buying you know, a loaf of bread, and he mentions barley there, and then he also mentions just fine flour. Right? It would be like being able to go to the store and being able to just get a whole loaf of bread or a lot of bread, a lot of food, if you will, for a very cheap amount, which would be you know, uh, 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 completely juxtaposed to what the situations are in this uh, uh, day prior to this. So this day, you know, they're having to purchase for, for a lot of money dove's dung. But then the man of God comes and he says, tomorrow you're going to be able to purchase good food for just a penny. Now, doesn't that kind of, wouldn't that seem, if we just looked around at reality outside of the Lord and outside of God, doesn't that seem very far-fetched? It does, doesn't it? It seems extremely far-fetched. But of course, this is the man of God that's coming to him. And this is a message from the Lord. So the Lord brings the message of the good tidings, of the, of the good news. The man of God brings the message from the Lord of good tidings, of good news, that there's a blessing that's going to be coming. There's a blessing that's going to be coming to the nation of Israel. Oftentimes when, when, when we're going through hard times and we are in the will of God, we are not being punished and we're not going through these hard times because of a sin that we have in our lives. Oftentimes the light at the end of the tunnel and the resolution is exactly the resolution of the problem that we need. In this sense, notice that what they need the most is food. What they need the most is, is this famine or this dearth to, be, uh, uh, to dissipate and to go away. What they are, 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 are you know, yearning for is for bread. That's what they need in this moment. And notice that God, the very next day, is going to miraculously and supernaturally provide for them the perfect resolution, the perfect blessing to counterbalance their trials and their tribulation. But notice that they had to wait for it. 
And they had to go through the problem. Yeah, and, and you know, this, this sermon, the wife said that it's culminating, not only concluding, but culminating is because there's a lot of people that were in Samaria at this time. There were people that were men of God like Elisha. Now, this wasn't because of Elisha's sin. Elisha wasn't going through the hard times because of his own sin. But there were people in Samaria that had sin and were being punished because of their sin. Then I'm sure there were also some people where the devil was using this to persecute them. So notice you have all of these people all in this same type of situation, but they're all going through the same trial and tribulation. I want you to notice that, but... The most important thing is to see this being a picture of them being in the will of God. So notice that they still are in the city of God here. They're still in the place of the nation of Israel. They're still in the promised land. So they are still in the city of God. And when they wait it out and they make it through the hard times, the tribulations and the trials, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Amen. And oftentimes, you know, you know you, you, when you're going through the hard times, you're going through the trials and tribulations, you can get to a point in your life where you can't see the light. Where you're just, you're just constantly dwelling on the negative. And I've went over this a couple of times. Where you're constantly just looking at the bad. And then you be, get, get to a point of hopelessness just like the king got to. Where he's like, this is never going to happen. And this, we, can, we can apply this to us personally, but we can also apply, to, apply this to us as a church. You know, us personally, when we go through hard times or problems or, or trials, you know, if we're trusting in the Lord and we are, you know, we're doing what's right in our life, and we're in the will of God, and we're seeking God's face, we're growing every day as a Christian. If you're going through problems and trials and tribulations, let me promise you that there is light at the end of the tunnel. I can promise you from God's Word that there will be light at the end of the the tunnel or the end of the trial you could even say there is light there and eventually God will provide and the good news is that he's gonna give you exactly what you need in that situation if you need bread God is gonna come and he's gonna provide bread if you are struggling personally financially God will answer that prayer and help you financially of course you know uh, uh, you know we we uh, uh, had a little bit of a, a, a problem here where we we're struggling with finances and I and I shared this with brother Hall for the first time is why it's on my my mind while well, bring it up now and, and uh, I was just looking at things, and I'm like, man, what are we going to do? You know, I was adding up the numbers. It's like, it's not going to work out. You know, something supernatural is going to have to happen. So I started praying to the Lord right around that time in a very specific prayer, a much more specific prayer than I normally pray. And I prayed five days in a row, Monday through Friday. And I was praying like five times a day. I mean, I was really praying this prayer. Just, God, please provide you know, more work at my company where I can have some overtime so that I can do what I need to do and I'll pay the difference. I'll make up the difference of what needs to be made up at the church. Because I was adding the numbers up and it was not, it was not happening you know, for our finances. At the end of that week on Friday, one of the project managers picked up the phone. And let me let, me let you know that we, had, we actually weren't even getting our 40, which is very different. We weren't even getting 40 hours during that period of time. Normally, I'm able to work overtime all the time. But we were getting 38 hours, so I'm like, oh, what is going to happen here? My project manager, one of the project managers, picked up the phone and called me and told me, hey, you know, I know that the hours are getting real scarce, but I have a project in Georgia that's going on right now and I know you and I knew about it and he said uh, I know you had, had offered to go up there a couple of times he said but I want to give a, uh, a proposition to you right now he said you're the first guy I'm gonna call because you know you always volunteer for the overtime and you had already volunteered to go up here for a couple of days if I needed you to he said but for the next three months I'm gonna be having a project and you are gonna have to sacrifice in the sense of work out of town but I will be flexible with you and I'll allow you to drive back and forth on Wednesday and Thursday morning and, and on Saturday and then you can come back Monday so that you make sure you don't miss your services. And he said, we're going to be working. He said, the catch is, you know, I hope you're all right with this, but we're going to be working 12 hours a day, six days a week. And I was like, you better believe I'm all right with that. That's perfect. It was literally exactly what I had been praying the entire week. And it was, a, it was a much more specific prayer because I was concerned about the finances of the church in this. And I was very stressed about it. And I just kept praying to God about it. And I knew that if anything was going to be resolved or fixed, that he was going to have to do it in this kind of situation. And at the, at the very end of the week, it was almost like he was Elisha coming to me to give me this perfect message of exactly what I needed. There's a famine, but hey... Here's the bread. And bread's going to be here. And it's like, how's this going to happen? I don't understand how this is going to happen. Right? 
but the Lord provided it. And oftentimes when you go through the problems, whatever the problem or trial or tribulation is, you have to go through it. And it's not just a day oftentimes, not just two days, three days. Sometimes there are problems and trials that last for a long period of time. Sometimes there are trials and problems. And, you know, obviously that's not good news. No one wants to go through these things for a long time. But sometimes, I mean, uh, uh, Abraham, how long did he wait on his child? You know, 20 years roughly. He's standing there just waiting for the Lord to come. Sometimes it's a long journey, but you have to just wait it out. You have to just fight it. But you know what? There's that, that light at the end of the tunnel. It's that perfect blessing of what you need. You know, obviously, there's, uh, we've been a little discouraged about getting people into the church. And, and you know, uh, Brother Bill came in like perfect timing when we had you know, hit like the, the, uh, the, the, the max of our discouragement. And he walked in one day and we expressed to him what a blessing it was. You know, but let me promise you that ultimately, once we make it through the trial and the tribulation, God will provide that perfect fix. Amen. People, all these seats will be filled and we'll be able to do a great work for the Lord and people will come. The Lord has to build the church. We, we of course, need to labor and do things on His behalf, but God is ultimately the one that has to provide the growth. He's the one that actually caused the growth. We can water and do all that, but the Lord gives the increase. Amen. Ultimately, it's going to be in His time. And you know what? There may be a period of time where we have to just keep waiting. You can't just have this selfish attitude, of, I, I want it tomorrow. I want it now. No, God wants you to go through this trial. God wants you to go through these hard times. But the good news is this. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Amen. I want you to look at verse number 2 now. It says this, Then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, now this is Elijah, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. I want you to notice that this man is not going to partake of the blessing. And what is the reason why? What did he just express? The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What did he just express? Does he believe the Lord? Exactly. He expressed doubt. He doesn't believe the, the Lord, does he? He's not trusting God. He's not trusting the Lord. He's showing that he doesn't believe it. He almost even mocks it. If, if there were, maybe if there were windows in heaven, might such a thing be, where God could just open up his window and throw the bread down. He's saying, there's no way. Look around. Look at what we're buying right now. And look at how much we're spending on, on dung. He's like, how in the world? The only way that that would happen is if there was in windows in heaven where God's just tossing us bread. God's just going to open up his window and throw it down to us. And then Elisha responds, because of his lack of faith, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. Now notice that he's going to see it. And that is also, and God does this oftentimes, that's meant to be kind of rubbing his nose in it. That's the purpose of that. It's kind of like how Haman you know, ended up building the, 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 the gallows for Mordecai. But who ended up being hung on those gallows, or hanged, sorry. Ended up being Haman on his own. God, God does this very, very commonly. In the book of, of, of Psalms, David talks about how they set a net and a trap for me, but they're caught in it. He'll do this very often because of the, uh, of the doubt here. Notice that he says, you're going to see it with your eyes. So he's going to get to see it, but he's not going to get to partake of it. So that's meant to kind of, uh, uh, you know, rub his nose in it, if you will, a little bit. Look at uh, verse number 3. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of, the Sy of Syria, behold, there was no man there. Now notice there, I want to, I want to, uh, there's a particular phrase in verse number 3. I want to focus on verse number 3. It says again, and there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? That's a, that's a powerful phrase. Uh, I, I, I heard a sermon a guy preached on that one time, and he used that as his title. No, I'm just kidding. I did one time, if you remember that. But this, this particular phrase is powerful because it packs a hard punch. It has, it has a, a, a strong, strong uh, uh, lesson or truth that's taught in it. 
What you have here is you have these leprous men. Now, leprosy is an incurable disease. It is a disease that, you, that, that, they, that there is no cure for. You're going to die. You, that's why they're outside the camp. They're not allowed to be in there because it's, it's very contagious and infectious. So they're sitting here and they're, and they're basically just, you just you know, uh, 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 pining away. They're, they're just slowly dying is what they're doing. The, the disease is just eating at them. And because they have this disease, do you know what it makes them do? It makes them be more conscientious of their life and of the amount of time that they have left. So they, they get to a point where they finally realize what's going on and they say one to another, why sit we here until we die? So because of this disease, it causes them to be more you know, uh, sensitive to the fact that what? They don't have much time left. But that's not only true about those four leprous men. That's true about you and that's true about me too. There's a truth from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It's taught over and over again. And you can find it in the book of Psalms. You can find it everywhere. Where the Bible says that life is but a vapor. It appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. The Bible, your life is likened unto a shadow, someone walking by. You see the shadow for a moment and then it's gone. Your life is likened unto a hand breath. A, you know, uh, uh, a breath is, is, it is uh, the width. That's what breath is. It's synonymous with the word width. So notice that the point is that it's not likened unto the uh, hand length, which is the longer portion of your hand. It is likened unto the hand breath. Why? Because he wants to make a point that it's short. Life goes like this. I feel like Jessica, my wife, turned 31 today and on her birthdays, of course, like anybody's birthdays, I'm sure you sit there and you just talk about, man, I don't feel that old. Man, I don't feel this age. You know, I don't feel that old. And she's just saying, I cannot believe I'm 31. And you know what she did last year? Exactly on this day, you know what she said to me? Man, I cannot believe I am 30. Why? Because life just flies by. I feel like I am, you know, there's certain portions of your life where you feel like it, it stopped for a moment and then it sped up. And it stopped for a moment and then it sped up. You know, last I remember, I was 25. And I remember when I was right around that time, I was thinking, gosh, I feel like I'm just 17. And I'm going to turn 31 this year. And, you know, yeah, I know I have a lot of my life left, but just looking at how fast these 30 years went by, I mean, the, the next 30, I mean, they're obviously not going to slow down. It feels like things are, are picked, like somebody's turning the dial and things are going faster. Life passes by fast. And before you know it, you're 30. And then before you know it, you know how old you're going to be? 60. And then later on, before you know it, you're going to be on your deathbed. You don't have to be a leprous man to understand how fast life goes by and how short life is. You know what these men noticed? Why sit we here until we die? You know what they knew? I'm going to die either way. But I, so, so you know what I want to do? I want to do something that's going to be of value. I want to do something that's beneficial. I want to do something that's of worth. And this is the attitude that we should have. I, 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 I challenge you to take a moment this afternoon, you know, do some, some introspect on yourself and some retrospect in your life and look and see what have I gotten done in my life. And I'm not talking about things that are shallow, things that are, that, that are not you know, meaningful. I'm talking about things that are beneficial for the Lord. What have you done for God in your life? Because if you're not doing things for God, you're sitting until you die. Because that's really the only thing that's of value. That's really the only thing of worth. We need to be spending our time on things for God's kingdom. We need to sp be spending our time on getting people saved, reading our Bible, you know, uh, you know, preaching the word of God to people. We need to be studying our Bible. We need to be praying. We need to be trying to, uh, you know, teach our children the word of God. You know, all of the things that were commanded, you know, just learning and growing in the Lord. We need to be putting all of our time and investing it somewhere where it matters and it's meaningful. We, can't, we shouldn't just be sitting around because if you're not doing things for the Lord, you're sitting around. You're just sitting around until you die. And we need to understand, you know, uh, that we, you know, uh, I know every time I get in Brother Hall's car, normally when it's when we're soul winning and, and, and I'll have my wife drop me off or, and she needs the vehicle, you know, he has, he has the verse, you know, right there, right over top of the time. You know, did you do that purposely? He did. So every time you look at the time, it makes you think about the time. And he has the verse printed there that says, teach us to number our days. And I, I, I think about that verse, and I used to send that Bible verse when I would send uh, a card to my uh, uh, nephews and nieces every year. I would include that verse. 
And when you, when you record that verse each year over and over and over again, it causes you to, to stop and think about that more so. And it causes me to reflect on my own life. And, 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 and you know, this is a truth that's taught all throughout the Bible. Teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days. And if you do, if you do so, what it's, what it's telling you to do, you think about each day. And, and think about if maybe today you found out you had a diagnosis of, of maybe leprosy or cancer. Let's say that you had a year left. How do you think you would treat each day for that year? You'd be very careful with your time, wouldn't you? You'd be very careful what you spent your time on. What if you had six months left? You'd be really, really careful. You'd be very conscientious on what you were doing for that amount of time. You know why? It would make you be more appreciative of the amount of time that you had left on this earth. Even if you have 50 years left on this earth, 20, do you know what you should do? You should be just as appreciative. We can learn from these leprous men because what they needed was they, they needed this, this disease to help them to realize, I don't have much time left. But that, that truth is not only applicable to them, it's also applicable to you. Their life is but a handbreadth, but those that are even living sco uh, you know, uh, uh, three score and ten years, seventy years, what we're promised, there, you are also said that your life is but a vapor. You're going to be 50, 60 years old, 70 years old on your deathbed, and you're going to look back, and the only thing that's going to matter is, what have I done for the Lord? Serve the Lord while you can. With what, however much time we have left, we need to be you know, putting it into things of value. Amen. Look at what it says there in verse number 5. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their lives their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it. And came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. Then said they one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. Verse number 8 where these leprous men go in and they, they take the gold, they take all of these things of worth, the silver. They take it and they go and they hide it. It reminds me of the parable that Jesus tells of the man that's given the talents and they take what they're given and then you know what they do? They go and they hide it. But you know what those talents were meant to be used for was for other people. That was the purpose. When, when he scolds them in that parable for not using those talents, and they were just taking them and hiding them, that represents the nation of Israel not benefiting or blessing all the other nations. And they're just trying to keep all this stuff to themselves. And when we read this here, you know, this, this, all of this stuff was actually the gold, the silver, the precious, all of these things, the raiment. God is the one that put these things into the leprous man's hands. But they were actually meant for what? The whole nation of Israel. They were meant for those in Samaria. And you see in verse number 9 it says, Then they said one to another, We do not well. That's a powerful statement right there. We do not well this day. I'm sorry, we do not well. And then he says this, This day is a day of good tidings. It was good tidings to who? To the leprous man. That's what he's talking about. This is a day of, he's saying in general, but he, he realizes he's taken part of this and it's good tidings. Now good tidings uh, uh, all throughout the Bible is, is typified by the gospel. It's typified by the blessing that comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the, go the word gospel actually means. It means good tidings. Notice these men here, they receive the good tidings. They receive the, the, the good news. And one of them at one point, after they had been partaking in it, in the Christian life, if you will, and all the blessings of the Christian life, one of them realized, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. And then he says this, and we hold our peace. And that's true about every Christian that doesn't share the gospel with another. That's true about every Christian that, that is, not, excuse me, is not a soul winner, that's not 
getting other people saved. What, they, what they're doing is they're partaking in this, in this life of Christianity. They're partaking in the good news, salvation, the blessings of the gospel. And you know what God would say about them? You know what you should say about yourself is you should have a moment where you finally realize we do not well. Amen. Why? Because this is a day of good tidings. You know what they realize? We should go share this with other people. We've received these good tidings and look at everything we've gotten from our salvation, from our life, all these blessings from the Lord. We need to go share these with other people. We need to go make sure that other people can partake of this. And we should have the exact same attitude when it comes to the gospel. We need to realize we do not well. We need to realize if it's been a long time since you've got somebody saved, since you've led them to the Lord, you need to realize I do not well. This goes for all of us. We need to try to look for an opportunity to share that good news and to share the gospel with someone and to make sure that we can you know, allow other people to partake in those blessings. God had a plan where He wanted other people to partake of those blessings. That wasn't just for them. He wanted the, all of the nation of Israel to partake of that. He wanted all of Samaria. You know what was true? They didn't do well. There was a day of good tidings. And it says, and we hold our peace. If you are holding your peace about the good tidings that you have partook in, you do not well. You're not doing well. The Lord, the, the purpose of this was so that other people could partake. Other people could partake in the salvation. But not only that, other people could partake in the blessings that came with that. And then he says... If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now, therefore, come that we may go and tell the king's household. Notice they had a selfless attitude where they cared about other people. They wanted them to partake. So they came and called into the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied and asses tied, and the tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. And the king arose in the night and said unto his servants, I will now show you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we be hungry. Therefore are they gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, When they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. And one of his servants answered and said, Let some take, I pray thee, five of the horses that remain, which are left in the city. Behold, they are as all the multitude of Israel that are left in it. Behold, I say, they are even as all the multitude of the Israelites that are consumed. And let us send and see. They took therefore two chariot horses, and the king sent after the host of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. So notice they had to take that leap of faith. They're all sitting there looking at this, and they're wondering, what is going to come about in this situation? You know, one man is, is thinking, well, you know, maybe the Syrians have set us up. Maybe the Syrians, there's no way. Maybe the Syrians have set us up. And then, you know, there's a, a, another man that speaks up and he says, well, let's just go see. You know, why don't we just send one of the horses and we'll just send just some messengers out and they'll just go, go, go see what's going on. You know why? Because it, it not, it's not making sense. They're like, there's no way that this could take place. Now, when those four leprous men, you know, they went in there and they found the, the, you know, everything to be just completely vacated. They're like, saying, they had the same exact response. They're like, what in the world is going on? And they were also worried, like, this doesn't make sense. So they went and they, they grabbed everything and they buried it. And they made sure they got out of there real quick and they took it and they buried it somewhere. Because they thought, you know, I'm going to have to come back for this later. And then they went and they got some more and they took it and they buried it. And, 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 and then, you know, planned on coming back for it again. And then they went to the city again and the, second, the third time, that is. Then they're like, oh, you know what? We just, you know, we're not doing well. There's other people that need to partake in this. Because that wasn't just meant for them. It was meant for the, the whole nation of Israel. It was meant for Samaria. And it's interesting how when God actually, when God does stick his hand in a situation and, and he is intervening divinely, it's interesting how he actually works. Because originally when the, the message of God was brought from Elisha, from the man of God, and he says, hey, tomorrow there's going to be two measures of barley for a shekel that's sold. People are like, how in the world is that even going to be possible? Right? They're like, how is that even going to be possible? And then you read the story and you see where the Lord actually, He came in and He worked divinely behind the scenes and, and He caused the Syrians to hear you know, a, 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 a sound that sounded as war. So they all fled away. And you know what they did was they just left everything there. Now, is, does everyone know exactly how God got in there and He worked this out? They didn't have a clue. 
They had no idea where, where it was that God intervened and where it was that God actually stuck his hand in and, how, and where he was in all of it. And sometimes that's how it works out. You know, sometimes the Lord just gets in behind the scenes where we can't see every little thing that he's doing, but he is still doing it. You know what you need to do is you need to just believe him anyways. You're not going to understand, and that's a lot of times that's where people fail, is they want to be able to see the step-by-step -step process of the Lord's work on how He's trying to give you the blessing that you're praying for, the blessing that you're waiting for. But you're not going to see it until the very end oftentimes, until the blessing is actually brought to you. Look at verse number 16 now. It says, And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians, so a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel. And then he says this, according to the word of the Lord. I like oftentimes when prophecies are restated. It'll often say, so, and then it will repeat word for word verbatim what the prophet or what the messenger of God actually said. And it just shows you that God is true to His Word. God is faithful and He will cause Amen. what He had prophesied to come to pass. And the things that He promises us, the things that He says that He will do for us, the blessings that He will give us, individuals, as a church, He promises that those things are going to come to pass and eventually they will, just as He said. So that a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the Word of the Lord. But look at verse number 17. And the king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have the charge of the gate. And the people trode upon him in the gate. And he died as the man of God had said who spake when the king came down to him. And it came to pass as the man of God had spoken to the king saying, Two measures of barley for a shekel and a measure of fine flour for a shekel shall be tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. And that Lord answered the man of God and said, now behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might such a thing be? It's just repeating him. And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. And so it fell out unto him, for the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. Now notice the other part of this that is, that is mentioned and is repeated. And the Bible, of course, the Holy Spirit is emphasizing this particular aspect of what took place. And again, what was the reason why this man wasn't able to partake? It's because of his lack of faith. It was because of his lack of faith. Now, always, every blessing that God has for us, the, the access or the key in order to get it is faith every single time. Salvation, it's faith. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, without faith it is impossible to please him. In order to get access to the blessings, in order for this man to have partook in this particular blessing, do you know what he had to do? He had to believe. He had to believe. And if we, in our Christian lives, are going to receive the blessing at the end of the tunnel, if we are going to be able to partake of that light at the end of the tunnel, do you know what we have to do? We have to have faith in God throughout the trial. And that's during that period of time when we read the Word of God and we see that God promises that He's going to work everything out in the end. Do you know what the key in order to get that to happen is? Faith. Do you know what the key is and, and how we can gain access in order to be able to uh, take part in that light at the end of the tunnel? God is going to bless His people, but are you going to be like the man on whom, you know, the, uh, the, who leaned on the king's hand? Maybe you just might only get to see it, but you don't get to partake in it. This happens, and you say, oh, that only happens to, you know, this wicked man, this sinful man. Oh, really? Because there's a guy in the Bible that's kind of important by the name Moses. Do you know what happened with Moses? He got to see, but he didn't get to partake, did he? What was the reason why Moses did not get to go into the land of promise? Because of a lack of faith. It was because of his lack of faith. And, but do you know what he did get to do? He got to look at it. And he got to see it. That sounds kind of similar. So this isn't just, oh, maybe this is a heathen man that this happened to. No, this happened to great men. This happened to Moses. One of the greatest men that's ever lived. And what was the reason? His lack of faith. 
His lack of faith. So what it shows you is, he, and when, did, when, did, when did his faith fall? It's when he went through hard times. Not only that, how long did the hard times last? 40 years. 40 years. That is a long, long time. 40 years he went through the trials and the tribulations while God kept telling him, there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's light at the end of the tunnel. You're going to get to the promised land. You're going to receive the blessings. That's the land of blessing. But do you know what ended up happening? He ended up doubting God. He ended up getting to a point where he didn't have the faith that he needed. And what was the reason why? He said, because you didn't believe me. And he got to see it, but he didn't get to partake of it. I don't want to just see it. I want to partake of it. Amen. I don't only want to just look at it. I want to be there and I want to experience it. You know, all the blessings that God has for me in my life personally, and all the things that He wants to help me in the areas that I... And I'm not talking about all finances, you know. I'm not just sit, standing up here and just preaching about things like that. That, that. that matters minimally. You know, that is a rare concern and prayer of mine. I'm talking about all the other spiritual blessings. You know, you know, a, a big a, a thing that we've been focusing on is church growth and getting people into the church. And hey, it can become you can become a little discouraged, but do you know what we need to make sure that we that we do is that we never start doubting God. Amen. We never start doubting the Lord and that He, uh, you know, isn't going to bring us to the end of that tunnel where we're going to see, receive the light. I don't want to just I don't want to just see it. I want to partake of it. I actually want to be there and experience the blessings when God blesses Valiant Baptist. I actually want to be able to partake of the blessings. You know, uh, and I want the same for you. I don't want you to become discouraged and, and to, you know, uh, go to a different church or go to, stop going to church at all. And, and you know what would happen is maybe you would just see ultimately when God blessed Valiant Baptist for all the labor that was put into it, but you wouldn't get to partake of it. I want to partake in every blessing that the Lord has for me. So I'm going to believe Him. I want to fight through the trial and I want to hang in there until the very end. And I don't want to start doubting the Lord of whether or not He's going to bless us, whether or not you know, God is actually going to come through and build the church as He promises. You know, I want, I'm going to believe Him through the trials and through the problems and through the tribulations. I don't want to be like the man who, who leaned on the king's hand. I, wanna, I want to actually see the blessing, and then I want to partake of the blessing. Just, just like all of the other men here, just like the king and everybody else. You know why? Because they believed the Lord when they heard the message of the Lord. They believed the Word of God. They actually believed that the Lord was, gonna, was going to do it. But also, you know what? I alluded to a moment ago, and I'm going to end with this. Yes, the Lord's providing it. Yes, God is the one that has to do it ultimately. But God uses you to do it. Now, behind the scenes, God was working. And he was, he, He's the one that caused the noise of the sound of chariots to be heard by the Syrian army so that they would flee and think that the Egyptians and the Hittites were coming. God did that, but do you know what else He did? He had four men that He was going to use. He didn't use a whole army, but He had four men that He was going to use. Not very many. He had these particular people you know, and, and oftentimes God likes to use a few people, like in the story with Gideon, because he ends up receiving the glory. So he had these four men who were not perfect men. They were leprous men. They had their own problems. They had their own issues. But you know what was uh, dependent upon? Do you, you know who was dependent upon? It was dependent upon those four men. It, if they wouldn't have went and brought this message... To Samaria, they wouldn't have known. So how did everybody else get to partake in the blessings of the Lord? Because of those four men. It's a perfect picture of you trying to grow the church, you're trying to receive the, the treasures of the gold and the silver, and these are all spiritual blessings, right? You, you want to grow the church, you want there to be growth and to get out of the famine and to get out of the dark valley. Yes, God will play His part. God will be there and guide you with the cloud. God will guide you with the fiery pillar, but you have to follow Him. God didn't pick Moses up and carry him through the wilderness. 
He brought them through a trial and a tribulation, but they had to follow him and do the work too. Those leprous men were the ones who brought that, those good tidings to the city. And if we are going to you know, build the church, yes, it has to be that we understand that the Lord is going to do it, but we have to be a, a tool in the hand of God. You have to get up off your butt and go do the work. You have to get up off your butt and go knock the doors. You have to get up and you have to go do the work that the Lord commands you to do. Amen. You can't expect to receive the blessing without doing the commandment that He has commanded you. You know, the way in which the churches grew was that people were preaching the Word of God and spreading the, the gospel to the city. If you look at Acts chapter number 2, the day of Pentecost, when the Lord, when the Lord blesses the church and the Lord adds... To the church, it took men to preach the gospel first. Just like it took these four men, leprous men, and it just shows that, hey, God uses the people that are imperfect. God uses the people with, in spite of their weaknesses, in spite of their problems, He uses them to go spread the gospel, to spread the good news, and then they bring the good news, and then you receive the blessing. Amen. Everybody together, all at once. But you know what it takes? It takes faith. That's the most important component. That's the most important uh, 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 element of all of it, is having faith. It guides you through the whole process, through the entire time, because without faith, you'll just give up. You won't even be in the, in the fight. You won't even be in the game. So you know what it takes? It takes faith. You know what you'll end up? You'll end up out of church without faith. You'll end up hopeless without faith. <laughs> So we must believe that there is light at the end of the tunnel. We must have faith that He will ultimately bless us. But you also, he, he provided the light, He provided the blessing, but you also have to walk to it. He'll guide you with the fiery pillar, but there's work involved too. He'll do all the miraculous work behind the scenes, but He's going to have four leprous men that He's chosen out. And they're going to have to go out and they're going to have to spread those good tidings. So what, you, know, we, you know what we need to do through our trials and tribulations? We need to keep our eyes on Jesus yeah. and all of His blessings and all of His promises that He's promised us. And don't doubt Him and don't, don't doubt when you're serving the Lord and the things that you're doing and whether or not you should be you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, spending and investing your time on this. Spending and investing your time in the church. Maybe I should just put more time in at my job. Maybe I should just put more time in this. Maybe I should just find a hobby and just spend all my time on that. Maybe, you know, all of these different things. Put your eyes on Jesus and on the blessings that He has for you. Because ultimately those things, you're just sitting around until you die. That's what you're doing. You're just sitting around until you die. It's all wasted time that you're never going to have any fruit for. So keep your eyes on Jesus and look at the light at the end of the tunnel. Have faith that it's there, but also walk towards it. Amen. And go and get it. Once you get it, give it to other people too. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you so much, dear God, for your promises. And that you're faithful. And that you, we can know for sure that you will provide the blessing. We thank you for your word and how it guides us through life and how we can have so many answers. We love you so much and please continue to be with us. Bless our church. Strengthen us. Help us to have strong faith. Dear God, help us to be in your will and to do what you would have us to do. I ask that you bless all uh, the children that are here today as well. And just uh, uh, be with us the rest of the day. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.